YouTube, baby. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Hey. Hello. Hello. All right. Uh, I'm a little more prepared this time. You must be a dunny. What is it? You must be a dunny. I think so. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> you have notes that are out of order. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. All right. So, uh, we're going to be starting in Matthew 24. Y'all want to turn to it? Oh, close. Starts at verse 36, and it's Jesus speaking, and he says, uh, However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. <clears throat> Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up until the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man returns. The two men will be working together in a field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would keep watch and not permit his house to be broken into. You also must be ready all the time, for the Son of Man will come when we least expect. A faithful, sensible servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while? And he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected, and he will cut the servant to pieces and assign him to a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, so basically the gist of that. Um, at least the main points that I want to touch on in that are basically that the, like I said in the beginning, that when Christ is, when Christ is going to return, it'll be like in the days of Noah, where in the sense that like people will be partying and they'll be doing all the things just as normally, like as far as like, it'll be like in the days of Noah in the sense that, um, uh, People just blatantly sin, and and we see that in the world today. I mean, we, we talk a lot about that. Uh, but as far as the other side of it, it'll be like in the days of Noah, where they won't. A lot of people won't exactly. They're not going to see what is happening. They're not going to understand that uh, that the flood is. In, the, in, in another way of saying, they're not going to understand that the flood's about to hit. That they'll. That, that, this is all about to be over. They'll be partying and, and enjoying weddings and etc. Uh, right up until the moment that it is, that it's here. Second is <coughs> the second main point is that it makes in this is that none of us know the day that the day, the time, the hour that he's going to come back. We don't know. Uh, we just don't know. And not even Jesus knows. The only one who knows is God himself. Um, and then, yeah, and, uh, and then the second points I just want to make on that are that the, in reference to the 40, uh, verses 45 to 51, uh, basically just kind of going over that, you know, 
a faithful servant is one who God can give responsibility to. Um, and this servant will spend his time spreading the gospel and taking care of God's people and spreading, basically doing God's will. Uh, the unfaithful servant is one who basically spends his, basically wastes his time and just spends his time taking care of himself and doing his own will. Um, basically, having said all that, I think that I think some people would think that this is basically talking about like believers versus non-believers, but I, I don't necessarily think so. I believe that it's specifically speaking to um, it's specifically speaking to people in general who claim to be born again, um, who claim to be Christians, and the difference between someone who claims to be a Christian and is actually born again and someone who is claiming to be a Christian but doesn't has not really been born again. Uh, in other words, as it says in another part of the Bible, I can't exactly tell you where it is, but um, you know, when it talks about being hot or cold uh, and how he's going to, uh, how basically Jesus will spit out it, you know, the ones who are not you know, hot and the ones, yeah. Lukewarm. Lukewarm, there you go. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, basically it's referencing the difference between a true born again Christian and a lukewarm Christian. Um, and then it goes on to and that's where I'm going to continue to. It goes on to two parables here to help it kind of put that into perspective. Um, the parable of the ten bridesmaids starts in chapter 25 of Matthew. And I'll go ahead and just read through that real quick. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridge room. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough oil for the lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take extra oil. When the bridge room was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were roused by the shout. Look, the bridge room is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because the lamps are going out. But the others replied, We do not have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridge room came. Then those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the others, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he came, but he called back, Believe me, I do not know you. So you too must keep watch, for you do not know the day or the hour of my return. That story, it's pretty self-explanatory, um, at least in that uh, translation. Um, I would say, uh, basically, there were five foolish bridesmaids and there were five wise bridesmaids. Five of them brought extra oil, five of them didn't. Um, I think the big, the the mistake that the foolish bridesmaids made were is they assumed that they had enough. They assumed that they that they were prepared. They assumed that they didn't they didn't basically they just assumed that they assumed they knew the time frame. <clears throat> um, basically in a nutshell, this, this parable basically shows us the danger of assuming that we know when he's going to come back. Assuming that we know um, that we'll have time to prepare before he comes back. In the sense that like that we'll see the signs and we'll just, uh, oh, well, it, now it's time, now it's time. Point is, is that there you you're not going to have time to prepare if you're not already preparing right now. I'd say by the time he gets here, by the time you start seeing, by the time you, by the time you, 
when he gets here, there will not be any more time to prepare. Just like the five foolish bridesmaids, uh, you know, he was ready. They had to go to the store and buy more oil. Well, it was too late. You're not going to have time when he comes back. Um, so the moral of that is prepare now because now is the time. Uh, and then going on to the next parable. It is the parable of the loan to money. And it's similar, uh, but it, I think it touches on a different point. Um, it said, and I'll read through that real quick. It starts at verse 14 of chapter 25. And it goes, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it into proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. After a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used the money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I earned five more. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. The servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. But from those who do nothing, even what little they have will be taken away. <coughs> Throw this useless servant into outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Basically, that was, uh, I'd say, pretty self-explanatory as well, but basically just goes the I say the main point of it um, as far as the as far as the lesson in the story here is <clears throat> the mistake that the third uh, that the basically the third third servant made was that he let fear and the assumption that he wasn't given what was necessary to achieve what he basically said to himself I'm afraid that I'm going to fail I'm afraid that I, that I don't have enough here and so just to be sure that I don't disappoint my master I'm, I'm just going to do nothing and I'm going to hide this money and keep it uh, so I don't lose the money but I don't lose what I've been given but I'm not going to produce any fruit. Basically, he let fear control. Uh, he let fear control. Um, and the lesson here is that in the in the final days, whenever Jesus comes back, whenever we're not going to be able to set, we we need to be a hundred percent sure that everything. We're using everything that God has given us to its to its fullest extent that it can be used. Because whenever He does come back, we're not going to be able to say, "Well, I didn't have enough, or uh, I had too much, or 
I didn't have this or I didn't have that because in reality, whether we realize it or not, God has given us everything we need to do the will that he has set before us. Um, I'd say, and, and, and that's, that's just the simple truth of the matter. It doesn't matter if you have nothing. It doesn't matter if you are the richest man on earth um, in the sense that if you've been born again and and you are trying to do God's will, it doesn't matter what you got. He's given you everything you need to do it. Um, that's pretty much it for that. Um, yep. All right. And then I was just going to read over this next section and kind of talk about it. And it talks about the final judgment. It starts at verse 31. Uh, it says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. And he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Now the goats being uh, one to... Uh, basically disobeyed God and the sheep being the ones who obeyed God uh, the sheep being the ones who followed the shepherd the goats being the one that whatever uh, then the king will say to those on his right come you who are blessed by my father inherit the kingdom prepared for you for the creation of the world for I was hungry and you fed me I was thirsty and you gave me drink I was a stranger and you invited me to your home I was naked and you gave me clothing I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and give you clothing? When did we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. Then the king will turn to those on the left and say, Away with you, cursed ones, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. For I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison and you didn't visit me. Then they will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you? And he will answer, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. Now, the um, I thought that was really interesting when I read that, um, in the sense that it basically means that, you know, as Christians... Whatever we're doing onto others is a direct reflection of how we treat Christ in his eyes. Um, and, I mean, the only thing I can really say to that is, uh, well, <clears throat> I would say this. I would say that, you know, if you ever see someone in need, if you ever see someone uh, that need your help and you have the ability to give it, then whatever reason you have in your head to not do it, think it's wrong. Think, well yeah, it's wrong. And think, you know, think of it as if if you need to, think of it as if, you know, if this was Christ sitting here, you know, what would I do? Because in the last days, in the days where we face final judgment, that's how he's going to look at it. Um, and I, I, I'm just coming up here, and I, I'm basically just reading out of the book uh, and kind of just talking about it. I don't have any, like, message of my own or anything here. Um, Um, 
yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, I really thought that would take a, a lot more time. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Lesson, the lesson I learned here today is uh, when you think you've written enough, write double it. <laughs> okay. So, uh, it was all good. What is it? It was all good. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. It was all good. But what I said, the service had to be X month long. long. I mean, yeah. You know. If he wanted to say more, he'd have told you to say more. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, this master who was going to go on a long trip and he has three servants and he gives one of them five talents, one of them two talents, and one of them one talent. Mm -hmm. Why would he give each one a different amount? Um, and why would he go five to one and one to the other? Unless he, he knows his servants and he has some expectation that they'll do well or do poorly based on that. And so he gives the one the five talents and he doubles it. He gives the one two talents and he doubles it. He gives the one one talent who he knows or, or feels certain is not really going to do much with it. Mm. So then when all is said and done, he's right. And so he takes the money from the, from the one and gives it to the one who did the best. When he's leaving this area, he's leaving probably with the expectation that Maybe he won't return. This is just what they're going to receive as their reward. You know, they'll get to keep it. But on the other hand, if you look at it like um, instead of five bags of silver, he gave him five things that he can use to go out and talk to people. And he gave another one a couple of things, and then there's one that he gave him something. Just this is me, I am God, and listen to what I have to say kind of thing. And, and the, the frustration is that the one that only got one didn't do anything. Mm -hmm. He didn't go out and talk to anybody. He didn't try to, you know, he was fearful. So he didn't try to save anyone. He didn't try to spread the word. He just stood back and, you know, filled the pew at the church, so to speak. Yeah. Whereas the other ones took the knowledge and the word that they had and shared it and brought other people mm -hmm. in. And I, and I kind of think when it comes to a parable and what I try to explain to these kids is a parable is for all senses of the term, come parable. Mm -hmm. So a parable is not necessarily a true story, yeah. but is comparable to something else that God's trying to teach yeah. or Jesus was trying to teach. So he spoke it in the form of, a, of something that's comparable. And usually a parable, I would think, has to have something to do with leading people mm -hmm. to believe. Yeah, leading them to a conclusion. Yeah, so in this case, I, I think the one that only that hid the money and did nothing, mm -hmm. this, is, this is someone who fills the pews. The one that had five and doubled it, mm -hmm. this is one who gets up and stands up there and tells people. And the ones that had two are the ones that come to church and they still talk to people and do do things like that. I looked, when I read it, I'd say the first time I read it, I looked at it like, basically like the the one, like he gave, like, like you just said, like he knew the capabilities of each of his servants. And you know, we look at that as God knows the capabilities of each of us. And what he gives us is is a direct correlation to what he thinks we're capable of. And I think that he gave the the last servant, the third servant, the one bag of silver because that's all he thought he could handle, or that's all he knew he could handle. And I think that the the last servant, while he was capable of handling that and doubling that as the other servants did, I think that he just we, it could be related back to like um, not necessarily I think as Christians we, we tend to uh, well I say I say I, I do this sometimes and that's I kind of forget like that you know I become like fearful of certain situations and I kind of forget that you know it's like I'm 
I'm a Christian, I'm a born again Christian. It's like I'm a child of of the creator of the universe. And it's like when I put that into that perspective, it's like why am I scared of this? And it's like when we let our like fears get in the way of basically doing what God has set before us, what really happens is we do nothing. Because we just kind of sit back and we watch and it's like, yeah, you, if you do nothing, you might not, you might not be taking the edge in this. You might not be taking the risk of, of, you know, making God angry with you because you messed up or because of this or that. But at the same time, it's like you're not achieving what He set out before you. So what was the point of doing that in the first place? And I think that was kind of the what He was trying to say when He was basically. When the master is like, well, why didn't you at least put it in the bank? Because then I would have gotten even a little return on it. It's like, but it's like I think he was trying to say, why did I even give that to you in the first place? Kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. I've always compared it to um, that that parable uh-huh. to gifts. God gives each yeah, person yeah. gifts, mm-hmm. and He gives you a gift to preach or teach or minister or or you know hospitality all the different gifts that god gives and i've always thought that he gives some people more gifts like some people can preach and teach and minister and and whatever sing whatever and then they either use all those or maybe they don't use them all and then he he don't give me no gift to sing for sure so maybe he gives me a gift just to teach but i'm not teaching yeah. Then I'm like the one that didn't use my gift. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's, a, that's You can swing that. <laughs> Another point that my Bible brings out is that when it says, um, I knew that thou art a hard man, he's talking back to God and said he knew he was hard. So he, he didn't know God at all because if he did, he would know God was just as true he's also loving and merciful and so uh, but he just used that excuse that he knew he was hard yeah. so he didn't do anything with it so he didn't even try and know God yeah. I haven't thought about it like that but that makes sense yeah. it's just another yeah. Yeah. Well, I think he knew what was expected of him he doubted. He didn't trust to go through the process. Mm-hmm. So a was sort of self-centered, more worried about himself yeah. and, and failing. He wasn't worried about completing a mission. Mm-hmm. He was more worried about his own self, so he just did nothing, which is a form of rebellion. Mm-hmm. Just like when God calls us to do something and we ignore that call or that little voice that says, go talk to that person mm-hmm. or remind them to come to church. When we ignore that call, we're in rebellion. We're just like that guy with the one, whatever, one amount of money. Mm-hmm. You know, we sit there and do nothing with it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know what else to add to that. Y'all understand this better than I do. <laughs> good discussion. Yeah, yeah. You did really good. Thank you, thank you. Uh, since we're discussing things, Here's something that I read the other day that I don't know if I can get y'all's opinion on. Um, it was in, well, now I'm have to find it, but it was in basically, uh, it's in Corinthians. And it basically talks about. Uh, basically says um, 
in a nutshell that like it basically says in a nutshell that men shouldn't have long hair or shouldn't pray or, well it's talking about praying but it, I would say it, it translates into just general life but I'm going to find it real quick but uh, it says basically says that men shouldn't have long hair and women shouldn't have short hair. And so I'm trying to get to a barber, really. I, I <laughs> no, I'm not, I'm not talking about Lisa's that. Lisa's job just can't get an appointment. No, no, I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I, I know where that was at. <laughs> but, uh, but no, I was, just, I was just interested in what y'all's opinion on it was because, uh, I don't know, I've never, I mean, I've heard like different, like different branches of Christianity or whatever like having like rules about that but I've never heard it preached in a church and it's like I always just chop that up to like oh, okay well that's that's just you know those different branches and their own versions of the Bible but and then I read it here and it's like I why have I never heard this kind of thing like in a in like in church I don't know but well, let me find it real quick Grant I had I had the same question yeah, yeah. um I used to go to church a long, long, long time ago mm -hmm. where kind of like the Catholic women, the older Catholic, we, we wore veils on our head, mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, that's how our phrase is. And veils, yeah. covering, because mm -hmm. to pray without it was considered, you were almost like a harlot that's had their head shorn. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking about it with my brother Guy a few years ago, and we were looking through the scriptures and he was trying to explain to me and he said and he's talking about Paul and I think it's in I might, I might be wrong but 1 Corinthians chapter 11 it says so whether you eat, drink or whatever you do do it all for the glory of God do not cause anyone to stumble whether it's Jews, Greeks or the church of God even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I'm not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Following my example, I follow the example of Christ. And then I think he went on to talk about, like if you are with a company of people and it's not their custom to eat meat, then don't eat meat. Mm -hmm. So the way I understood it, you know, in some cultures the women prayed with their heads covered yep. and so to do something out of the culture mm -hmm. would cause somebody to stop like they're focusing oh look she's over there praying with and yeah. you don't want to do that where that's not so much our culture but I don't know that's kind of how I understood it yeah I'd say I, I, I'm pretty sure what I was reading was the same thing because I remember it talking about like it was it talked about like part of it talked about like if uh should i eat meat that's being sacrificed to other gods even if i don't like should i should i partake in eating this and it's like and it goes into like basically it's like it's like as long as you're not like as long as you don't believe and you're not sacrificing those things that there's not anything inherently wrong with eating it but that in eating it, you might cause someone else to stumble because if they see you eating that, then like they might think, well, this guy's a Christian. And, yeah, yeah. But it was the same kind of right. point. Yeah. I had struggled with that for a little while. Yeah. Um, you know, because even in some of the old Southern, way back in the fifties, women wore head coverings, mm -hmm. hats, yeah. to church. And so I, I struggled with that a little bit. And I read it, come across it, and then I was reading further, and I asked Brother Gar some questions, and we were looking at scriptures together, and he was explaining to me oh. how, I forget how he worded it exactly, but basically that it goes according to the cult. It was uh -huh. talking about the culture in those times. Yeah, yeah. I'll say this. I'll say that. Like, I don't necessarily. I think if the Bible said it's like, if the Bible says it outright, it's like I don't have any problem, like, 
I'll say, I, I'll say that, like, when I said that, like, brought it up, I wasn't th thinking, like, oh, well, I would have long hair and the Bible says I can't. It was more like, that's just kind of odd that I've never heard that preached before, mm -hmm. like, ever. But Nazarites, weren't they traditionally, didn't they wear the long hair, too? I don't know. I think the Nazarites were not allowed to cut their hair. They were not allowed to cut their hair. Yeah. But, yeah, the, I think so, it's... I don't know. There's some denomination where they 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 are heavily on that, but they're not allowed to cut their hair, and that's a modern time. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I just thought it was interesting, and I'm out of stuff to say. So. Um. Here, moving on from that, um, y'all talk about something kind of really controversial. Um. He goes on to say, I I, I really want to find this specifically because. I'm going to just say this without reference here, but uh, it basically goes on to say that after that, shortly after that, if I'm remembering correctly, that basically, you know, man was created to glorify God and woman was created to glorify man. And I guess I just wanted to know while we're discussing things, what y'all's opinion on that was, and like how, what that means. Well, woman was made for a help meet for the man. Yeah, yeah. So, that's just that. Yeah. <laughs> we don't like it, but that's yeah. just that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I'm just like, I don't know, yeah. just, just bringing up things to discuss. <laughs> First Corinthians chapter eleven. Is it that? I'll tell you how. <clears throat> Come on, Scott, spit it out. Yeah, it's about <laughs> uh, chapter eleven. Uh, Joseph's right. Um, I think where you're at in there is around chapter or around verse thirteen. Yeah. Um, So the latter part of that, uh, verse 15 and 16, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if a man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And I think when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he's writing about the Old Testament, about the laws of the Old Testament, but we don't he doesn't live in that time. Mm. And then he's, I think he's just referring back to that when he's talking and saying that women have long hair, which is a covering, yeah, like yeah. she was talking about wearing a veil or something like that. Mm. And men have no need for that. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's it's referring back to the Old Testament when that was the belief. Mm. And he's, he's saying that was the belief back then. He's not necessarily saying that's where we need to be right now. Well, but I think he's referring to that that time. I would say the only reason I might disagree with that in particular would be that like in this in in Corinthians, he's basically like answering questions for the churches of that time. Like these churches are asking like him questions and he's just like it's like Here's a question, and then he's just answering it. So it's like if that was referencing Old Testament, <coughs> why is he telling new, basically New Testament churches these answers? Well, you're right at that breaking point where the New Testament was just starting. So yeah. a lot of churches still were adhering to Old Testament, Old Testament customs, and um, there was a lot of controversy. Uh -huh. Over the new versus the old, the difference. The <coughs> um, Jesus said, "I did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it." Yeah, yeah. And through him, he fulfilled the law perfectly. So. In verse eighteen, he it says, um, first of all, when you come together in church, I hear that there are divisions among you. You know, I I think maybe that was some of their division." And he was answering some sense. of their divisions yeah. of, and, and I don't know, 
I don't know what it means, but the 16 that he read where he said, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. So maybe yeah. he's kind of saying, you know, yeah, that was Is old. It? Maybe we don't need to do that anymore. Uh-huh. I, I don't know. I don't know. I just want to read the Bible. <laughs> what kind of Bible is this? New? It's falling apart Bible. Living. NIV. Living. And eleven, fourteen, and 15, uh, in this translation, it <coughs> says, In talking about head coverings and length of hair, Paul is saying that believers should look and behave in ways that are honorable within their own culture. In many cultures, long hair on men is considered appropriate, like, say, the Nazarite, yeah, yeah. and masculine. In Corinth, it was thought to be a sign of male prostitution in the pagan temples. And women with short hair were labeled prostitutes. Paul was saying that in the Corinthian culture, Christian women should keep their hair long if short hair on women was a sign of prostitution. Then a Christian woman with short hair would find it even more difficult to be a believable witness of Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't saying we should accept all of the practices of our culture, but that he should avoid appearances and behavior that detract from the ultimate goal of being believable witnesses for Jesus Christ while demonstrating our Christian faith. Okay. So uh, I think he's just saying it's appro- do what's appropriate yeah. for your culture. Yeah, and don't, don't do things that are, that are going to get in the way of, of achieving God's will. That like blatantly get in the way of that. Like personal things. Thing, things that might become a stumbling block. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that makes more sense. Well, 